So that's that's I think the main thing. Okay. Then if you have I'm so excited and nervous, I'm so excited and nervous. <laughs> you say you give like an introduction. Okay. Before you actually go to your interviews. So if you have some of these facts in slides so like on the slide. Bullet points. Yeah. Okay. So you have <laughs> Breakfast. Wait, go ahead, Lord. If I'm meeting up with my students on the conference side, so I have fruits, pancake, scrambled egg, and um, hash, pot hash potatoes or hash browns or whatever. I also have bananas and uh, oranges. So I don't think I'm gonna be eating lunch. I don't know. We'll see. So that's it. Ciao. Okay, so Brianna and Kishana are coming Hi. from their rooms. So we are going to go ahead and go to the presentation. And I'm going to have a video of them presenting. <laughs> So, my research students, Brianna and Kishona, getting ready for their presentation. They are next. So, Tennessee Department of Corrections are trying to focus on those who are nonviolent offenders to get them to be under community supervision instead of housing them in prison or incarcerating them. So the two programs that I interviewed over the summer was the best program, which is Building Entrepreneurship Success Leadership in Tennessee and Men of Valor. The best program started in 2014, and that first year that they opened up their program, they focused on male participants at the location, the Charles Bass Complex Correctional Location. But due to the Tennessee Department of Corrections reasonings, they closed down that facility, thus segueing into Tennessee Prison for Women, Tennessee Prison for Women, and having all women participants. The research that I wanted to focus on was that this was an in-prison program in comparison to aftercare for men the Valley. The program includes with best is personal development, money management, financial literacy, um, entrepreneurship skills, and also how to get ready for jobs once they're released. This program usually runs from October to April, so within my research, there is gonna be an exclusion on one year because the research is still, the program is still running on, and the participants has not been released yet. Men of Valor is an in-person program. The in-person program is the Jericho Project. They teach them job readiness, the word of God, personal development, addiction, counseling, and then they also have aftercare, which is Valor Ridge, and that's the data that I used here in my research with the aftercare data. The aftercare actually starts from the time they're released from prison, and that's how they're able to track the recidivism rate once they're in that program. Their program, of course, includes discipleship, anger management, money management, and job readiness. They actually have 100% employment placement once they reach that facility and once they reach aftercare. The next slide here is showing the best graduates and men of our graduates along with their recidivism. So within the first year here, BEST had a total of 22 participants that applied for the program. And out of that, 18 of those went on to graduate. From those graduates, four people reincarcerated, leaving the first year at 22.2% recidivism. How I was able to calculate my recidivism is that I took the number of reincarcerated over the number of graduates to be able to get my recidivism. The next category, Men of Valor, they had 15 total participants applying for the program, and two of those graduated, but neither of them reincarcerated, leaving them at a 0%. Out 
As you can see, over the five-year period with the BEST program, they had a consistent steady amount from graduates to participants, and their recidivism rate tended to decrease over the five-year period. Whereas men of valor, their total participants to graduates was not steady at all. It fluctuated a lot. Men of valor, also over the five-year period, um, recidivism rate did fluctuate, start at zero, then go back down to zero. Men of Valor has actually been around since 2009, but for the basis of my research, I wanted to look at it from a five-year period. Research shows that with Men of Valor, they did not have an equal amount of participants to graduates, and that, and that with that kind of disparity from graduates to participants, that it started to show a lot of problems within their recidivism rate. That goes on to my next slide, here, I'm, comparison, I'm comparing the graduates to non-graduates. They had a total of 34 graduates over the five-year period, and a total of non-graduates was 94. This is just showing you guys the makeup of the demographical values of the graduates to the non-graduates. But the main thing to focus from this table is that the months in aftercare, 94 people spend less than six months in aftercare. My research shows that the typical months that they spend in aftercare for those non-graduates is one to three months. The participants and graduates who stayed longer than the six months, out of the 34 graduates, four were reincarcerated. And then out of the 94 that did not graduate, eight of those reincarcerated. Hmm. Moving on to the next table is going to be talking about the recidivism rate from that of Tennessee Department of Corrections to the rehabilitative program graduates. Roughly, Tennessee Department's recidivism for the five-year period is roughly around 48%. 2018 and 2019, recidivism rate was not available on the OpenMAP website. This is where I got my data from, was to be able to pull it from that website to show you guys the recidivism rate over the five-year period. I was able to calculate through the graduates the recidivism rate for the BEST program as well as Men of Valor. The average for the BEST program is 8% over the five-year period, and the average for Men of Valor recidivism rate over the five-year period was 19.4. The next table is just I just wanted to put this up here to show you guys the Tennessee Department of Corrections releases to violators return. These two, um, these two sections right here cannot be intertwined because they do not have unique identifiers. So if you guys have any further questions for this table, I do not mind going back to it and explaining it further for you guys. But this was just, I just wanted to put this in there for you guys to look at. The next um, table is actually giving you a more concise number of the recidivism rate for Tennessee Department of Corrections for a year-by-year year release. And recidivism is tracked over a three-year period. So if someone was released in the year 2010, they calculate that from three-year period to be able to see what their overall recidivism is. Mm -hmm. This recidivism rate have unique identifiers within this number. Like I said, state, like I stated before, that the roughly average of the recidivism over that five-year period is 48%. The next set of tables are going to be just a demographical makeup of the programs and that of Tennessee Department of Corrections. Tennessee Department of Corrections average felon population rate is roughly around 29,000 people in the whole, for the five-year period in the incarceration. Mm -hmm. If you focus on the gender here, not comparing gender who is better than who, but with the males, it is a steady consistent of males going into the system over the five-year period. And if you look at the female section, you can see that the females start to increase over the five-year period of the offenders without any contributing factors or understanding why female participant, um, excuse me, female felons are increasing. With the demographic for ethnicity, you can see that there is actually a steady increase in whites that are being incarcerated and that with blacks, we are actually being de we're decreasing over the five-year period. The next set of tables are actually going to be talking about the demographical makeup of the programs. This is, oh, excuse me. This is the Dem Tennessee Department of Demographics of age, gender, and ethnicity year by year. If you look here, ages 39 through 40, 30 through 49, has, actually has the highest age category in Tennessee Department of Corrections system over the five year period. And that research shows that this, um, this age category falls in and out of Tennessee Department of Corrections um, 
very frequently over these two category into these categories. Um, of course, in my previous table, you can see that the black and white, the white is, has a very fluctuation. It's not really increasing or decreasing within white. It's very steady, and the black, of course, are decreasing over five year periods. And then with the females, they're increasing, and the males are have a steady fluctuation of the incarcerated individuals. Now the next table is the demographics for the best program for race and gender. The overall program had 80 graduates, and I just wanted to show you guys the demographic makeup of the graduates from black to white, not comparing race by race. I just wanted to show you guys the makeup of the program for the best program. For the first year, they did have 18 male participants, and then over the following years, they did segue into the Tennessee Prison for Women, so now that focuses on women. Uh, participants here. The next table is going to look at excuse me, Men of Valor's makeup, demographic makeup. They had a total of 34 graduates, and of that, they had an equal number for black to white in their graduate program. This is as well just showing just the demographical makeup of their program that they have. Now, I wanted to show you guys the ages category the highest age category for men of valor that they had in their program and the ethnicity that they had. The highest age category was 29 through 39, and they have a majority of black that were the overall participants within their program that they had. Without any kind of contributing factors, this is just who all applied for their program, but you can see that there were more black within this age category that applied for that program over the five year period that I looked at. The next table is for best as well, this is the best program, of course, is an in-prison program. They actually had the highest age category for 40 through 50 of white women applied for the program within the five-year period of the data collection that I collected for there. The next table is going to get into the charges. I wanted to let the research show that Tennessee Department of Correction's highest charge that has for incarcerated individuals are person charges. Person charges include homicide, kidnapping, sex offenses and assault. You can include domestic as well as domestic violence and person charges. So Tennessee Department of Corrections had the higher number of person charges over the five year period that I looked at. That was the highest charge. And I wanted to compare it to that of the two programs that I looked at. With the best program, they had more property charges, property charges is more of burglary, fraud, uh, forgery, fraud, theft, or robbery. And then a valor actually has an equal number between person and property charges for their program. Men of Valor does not accept any sex offenders, any mental health uh, participants, or any disability participants because both programs are not for property for their donation based program. So Men of Valor has their restrictions on who they accept. So of course, majority of the participants are gonna be that from person or property charges. Mm -hmm. That is actually concluding my tables and I wanted to show you guys my statistical analysis that I wanted to test that if these programs are in fact helping Tennessee Department of Corrections reduce their recidivism rate. I found strong evidence that in fact that these are these programs are in fact helping. And from the strong evidence, the p-value is lesser than that of the level of significance, so I had to reject my new hypothesis, because the new hypothesis is that it was going to be equal to 50.5% or greater than that. But without rehabilitative programs, that it was going to project that it was going to be increasing rather than decreasing. But what I predicted that on this test statistics was that I had uh, negative 4.51, which is up to here, that my p-value was less than that of my level of significance. So without rehabilitative programs, Tennessee Department of Corrections recidivism will only increase. But with the help of these two programs and focusing on re-entry, recidivism is actually decreasing with the help of these two programs. And that is the conclusion of my presentation.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kishana Otis and I am a current student. For the purpose of this presentation, my mentor, Dr. Magruder, and I decided I would focus on the racial disparity aspect of exoneration. In recent years, there has been a heightened focus on the performance needed to make our criminal justice system more equitable. It is no secret that criminal factors play a strong influence in the criminal justice system today. In fact, you can also observe these racial influences in exonerations as well. An exoneration can be defined as the release of an individual who is at first convicted of a crime, then later deemed innocent of that crime. In the United States, African Americans make up 40% of the incarcerated population. However, they only make up 14% of the US population. It would be logical to infer that since African Americans have high incarceration rates, they would also have high exoneration rates. I will later explain that there's a third variable that actually contributes to high exoneration among this ethnic group. In the state of Tennessee, there have been 21 exonerates per the National Registry of Exonerates since 1989. Out of these 21 individuals, seven of them, or 33%, identify as African American. When compared to the state population, African Americans only make up 17.6% of the state population. This means that African Americans within Tennessee are exonerated at a rate that is nearly double their entire representative population. One factor behind this is the fact that African Americans are more likely to be wrongfully accused of crimes, which leads to these high exoneration rates. I've actually made a table of the seven individuals who have been exonerated in Tennessee that are African American. The first factors from the table I want to analyze are the crimes that these individuals were convicted of. Murder and sexual assault are the two leading crimes that African Americans are exonerated of in the nation. Although only two individuals from my table were exonerated for murder-related offenses, murder is the number one crime that African Americans are exonerated of in the country. In fact, an African American is 50% more likely to be innocent when convicted of a murder crime than other ethnicities. One reason behind this is the fact that African Americans do commit a lot of violent offenses. However, most of these violent offenses are targeted towards members of their own ethnic group. African Americans only kill and victimize Caucasians at a rate of 15%. However, they're exonerated for killing Caucasians at a rate of 35%. This means that African Americans are more often accused at a rate that's actually higher than how much they actually commit these crimes. The next crime I want to analyze is sexual assault, which is the most frequent on my table, representing 60% of these exonerations. When compared to national statistics, African Americans are three and a half times more likely to be innocent when convicted of a sexual assault crime than other convicts. One major part behind this is the fact that eyewitness identification is a leading crime, is, I'm sorry, excuse me, is a leading reason behind exonerations in the nation. It is in fact the leading, the leading is in fact the leading factor that contributes to exonerations in the, in the entire nation. The reason behind this is the fact that let me change the graph. The reason behind this is the fact that memory is very unreliable, especially when we're calling traumatic events. On a racial aspect, an individual in a racial aspect, individuals who are charged of um, on a racial aspect, individual. Um, is more likely to actually misidentify or falsely identify an individual that's of a different ethnic group than they are. Actually, it is a fact that an individual of a certain ethnic group is 1.56 times more likely to falsely identify an individual of a different ethnic group. When analyzing my table, all these sexual assault crimes involve a misidentification from an individual of a different ethnic group. So these two factors, memory and the fact of racial aspect, lead to high exoneration rates among this ethnic group. The second thing from the table that I want to analyze are the sentencing and the sentences that these men were received. 48% of these individuals received a life sentence. Hmm. When you are comparing this to national statistics, the US commissioning a sentence commission actually made a study from 2012 to 2016, and it showed that African Americans received longer sentences at a rate of 19.1% for crimes that other individuals of different ethnicities committed 
the exact same. So this is a problem because it is a violation of the equal protection that should be mandated under our constitution. Mm -hmm. This is significant in exonerations because it means that these individuals are potentially serving more time for these crimes they did not actually commit. Mm -hmm. The third factor from this table I want to analyze are the inadequate def adequate defenses. Inadequate defenses make up 20% of my table for the circumstances that led to these exonerations. African Americans make up a large proportion of the lower socioeconomic status. Individuals who cannot afford to hire the top attorneys are given court appointed attorneys or public defenders. Public defenders have an average of seven minutes per case a year. No attorney can accurately read, critically think, analyze, and examine a case and find the best solution to it in less than seven minutes. This means that this is leading to high incarceration rates in our criminal justice system as well as high exoneration rate. So let's discuss Adam Tatum, who was a man who lived at Salvation Army Halfway House in Tennessee. He got into a verbal altercation with another resident of the Halfway House that ended up with him shaking the man by his collar and repeatedly. The police was eventually called, and when they arrived on the scene, the two men dispersed and stopped arguing with each other. However, one of the police officers came behind Mr. Tatum, grabbed him by the neck, and threw him down in a headlock. The two officers then proceeded to grab their batons and beat Mr. Tatum, hitting him over 100 times each with their mm -hmm. baton. Mr. Tatum's uh, leg actually broke during the altercation and pierced through his skin, causing blood splatter all over the floor. Hmm. Following after this incident, the other police officers arrived on the scene and continued to beat Mr. Tatum and bash him while he was laying on the ground and handcuffed. They then escorted Mr. Tatum outside, where he eventually collapsed on the pavement. While waiting for the ambulance, some of the officers went back inside the Salvation Army to clean up the mess, while others stood outside and waited Mr. Tatum and continued to beat and kick him while ambulance was on the way. When first responders arrived on scene, they initially thought Mr. Tatum was shot because of how much blood they seen. Mr. Tatum required immediate surgery. When Mr. Tatum got to court, he was charged with simple possession, assaulting of the other resident, and assaulting a police officer. Mr. Tatum pled guilty to all these crimes and was sentenced to two years in prison. Later in 2013, a video service that was security footage from the Salvation Army. The video showed that Mr. Tatum never physically assaulted any police officer and showed the brutal and enduring beating that he received by the officers. His defense never knew the video even existed or was allowed to see it before it was released to the public. Mr. Tatum immediately put in a uh, submitted to retract that plea that he assaulted a police officer. Although he did plead again guilty to the marijuana and to the assault of the other victim, he did not, he was eradicated for the charge of assaulting a police officer. Mr. Taylor then proceeded to sue the police department for millions of dollars and only received 135000 in that he will walk with the law, a limp for the rest of his life. Let's discuss Clark McMillan, who was a resident in Shelby County in 1979. In 1979, a Caucasian couple was parked in a car when they were approached by a black man loading a knife, demanding them to get out of the vehicle. Once out of the vehicle, the man robbed the boyfriend and escorted both the individuals into the forest. Once in there, he made them strip out of their clothes and lay naked on the ground. He then proceeded to rape the female victim. Afterwards, he demanded both of the individuals to stay on the ground until he was away from the scene. Once they received their clothes, they could not find their car keys and had to wave down a car to take them to a friend's house. Once they arrived at a friend's house, that, that's when the police investigation immediately began. The two individuals went to the police department to give their initial descriptions of the perpetrator. The woman was also examined and they found a, a semen all on the lining of her inside of her pants. Due to the lack of technological advances, they were not able to test the semen for DNA. The woman and her boyfriend were given a photo lineup where she selected no one and the boyfriend selected a filler. A filler is someone who was put in the lineup who is not the suspect that the police is trying to uh, identify. When given the live action lineup, the boyfriend again chose the filler and the woman chose McMillan. McMillan was then indicted on charges of rape and robbery with a deadly weapon. Although McMillan had alibi that he was at his sister's house with his girlfriend at the time of the incident, 
and both his sister and girlfriend testified to him being with them, he was still charged with the robbery and rape and sentenced to 119 years in prison. Mm. All of McMillan's appeals were denied until 1996 when the Innocence Project accepted his case. Uh, due to how much time had passed, and again, the lack of technological advances, they were not actually able to submit the original genes for DNA testing until 2001. It was then that the genes came back proving that Ms. McMillan was not the perpetrator. I found these two cases significant because they show the frequent inequalities that African Americans face in our criminal justice system today. Issues such as police brutality, issues to, to longer sentences, all contribute to the racial disparity that is an issue in our criminal justice system. Until we are able to ratify these issues, African Americans will continue to have high incarceration rates, as long with high exoneration rates in our nation. And that is the conclude. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you all for allowing me to present. If you have any questions, please.